Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. Let me express on this Lord's day my genuine gratitude to all of the personalities responsible for my being here at Trinity. It's a delight to be back here at the university and seminary. I want to thank Felix Theonoustos for the, uh, <laughs> I told him since I couldn't get his name right, I'll just give him a Greek word for the day. I said, we're going to be in trouble if I say that and nobody in chapel find that to be humorous. <laughs> the, the professors of Greek New Testament wouldn't smile upon that at all. I'm delighted to be here. It's a joy to be here on this day you would not know how much you mean to me and have meant to me over the years. The different personalities here at this school, many who are now alumni and alumnae, I'm grateful to be here on this day. I received some correspondence that asked me if I would at least address in some way the theme reconciliation from a pastoral perspective. And I want to begin today, I know we'll only be together a couple of days, but let me begin today with reconciliation theologically. Take your Bibles with me and open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to begin reading at verse 18 and concluding at verse 21. This text is tailored to tell us something about being an ambassador without an embassy. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of the word? This may be the only time you move and I wouldn't want anybody to say West came from Texas all the way to Illinois and didn't move us one time. <laughs> Listen to what Paul says to us in this series of lectures. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you in Christ, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God. You may be seated. There is something about the verticality of life. You look at a flagpole or a telephone pole and it reminds us of something about the vertical dimensions of life. You look at the sleek, glassed, high-rise buildings in the city of Chicago, and you look up and you say, there's a verticality about it. But we don't just look up, do we? We also look out on the horizon, and we say that there's not just the verticality, but there is something horizontal about life. In our invited existence, we see the two dimensions, the vertical and the horizontal, but one is ineffective without the other. You see, if all we have is the vertical, we're just looking up. We'll just have light poles, lamp poles. If all of life is horizontal, we're just looking out on the plane. You need one and the other. You probably know then that I'm speaking of something more significant 
the lamp poles, light poles, telephone poles. I'm speaking about something else, the cross. There is the vertical and the horizontal direction. And you notice that one cannot sustain or be sustained without the other. There has to be the vertical, but there also has to be the horizontal. But we've seen this happen in our American culture where one dimension has tried to sustain the other without the other. For instance, in much of our, and I say this reverently, you may come from some of these backgrounds, but I say it reverently again, some of us come from the background maybe of some mainline Protestant denomination who has tried to sustain its entire theology and ministry purely on the horizontal. But regardless of how good it is, the horizontal could not be sustained without the vertical. But many of us who come from strong evangelical backgrounds, we've seen it also where we have high verticality with no horizontal dimension. You need not just the vertical, but you need also the horizontal. This is what the Quaker, D. Elton Trueblood, spoke about years ago when he interpreted our civilization as a cut flower generation. He said that we are a cut flower civilization. We've been put in beautiful vases. We look so attractive and appealing, but we cannot be sustained because we've been severed from our roots. Many of us, we want the fruit without the root. <laughs> you can't have one without the other. Paul knew something about that, especially as one who served as a pastor of a church that on every page needed reconciliation. In fact, he understood it so much that he tried to get the Spain to preach the gospel, but he couldn't go because he couldn't leave behind his unreconciled church. They were embracing one dimension without the other. In fact, you can have fun, can't you, just looking through the window of the Corinthian congregation and on every pew there's a problem. Chapters 1 through 4, you have the division of leadership. One saying, I'm of Apollos. Another saying, I'm of Cephas. One saying, I'm of Paul. I'm of Christ. Cutting Jesus up into little pieces. You look through another window and you look on another pew and you see in chapter 5, divisions of immoral, unethical behavior in the church. You look through another window in chapter 6, another pew messed up marriages in chapter 7 and chapter 6, people being dragged off to court. And you see in chapter 9, arguments about compensation packages for the pastor. You look at chapter 10 and 11, you see people who are exploiting the Lord's Supper in chapters 12, 13, and 14, where there's this division and schism about spiritual gifts. And in chapter 15, questions and arguments about bodily resurrection and the collection discrepancies in chapter 16, Paul says, I can't go anywhere to preach and leave an unreconciled congregation behind. This leads us, I do believe, in some sense, to look at the theology of reconciliation, the very ministry to which we will be called. Some of you who are here you will aspire and you will have to do your work in the academy. Others of you, probably the most of you, will do your work in pastoral contexts. And you'll find yourself being ministers of reconciliation. Look at these verses that we've read together on today with me. Look at verse 18 and consider the very name of God that is reconciliation. In verse 18a, it reads, all of this is from God. All of this suggests all of what Paul has discussed in the previous verses. And then he says, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Now, when you look at this, the first thing that seems to come to mind for me are those persons that we know by name 
and their adjectives. For instance, we know something about Alexander the Great or Catherine the Great, Richard the Lionhearted, maybe in a less way, but Ethelbert the Bald. All these names combine their sovereign ruler and the characteristics, and they describe it, and it goes on. But here when it says in verse 18a, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and all of this is from God, there is something that's not apparent in the English that's apparent in the Greek. It is here that God is called reconciler. And it's actually a name that's expressed in a participle phrase that's kind of difficult to translate. We would have to translate it in hyphenated ways. The God hyphen, who hyphen is reconciling hyphen, us hyphen to hyphen himself. <laughs> Strange name, God the reconciler. In the Old Testament, we know him as God El Shaddai. But now in the New Testament, he has a new name, God the Reconciler. And this is one of the great ways to reveal his very nature is to understand something about his name. His name reveals his nature, doesn't it? God the Reconciler, the same way that the sun gives light, God reconciles. The same way a flower emits fragrance, God reconciles. The same way the wind turns the weather vane, so God turns us in his direction because God reconciles. God's always reconciling. He didn't just begin this. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam steps out abounds in the very lane that God had established for him to walk in. And God, as far back as the garden, prepares animal skin to cover up the nakedness of Adam and Eve because he's always reconciling. Inaugurating a reconciliation kind of form on the mountains of Sinai where he forged a sacrificial system where the blood would be spilled in order for humanity to be reconciled. But all of this is pointing to something, isn't it? This is not about animal sacrifices. You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar. Even the casual reader of the scripture catches the significance of that. From the Old Testament, you can see it pointing to the new of one who is coming, who alone can reconcile us, and nobody else can do it. No animal. No animal sacrifice, only one who is sent who can do that. Christ Jesus on the cross only can do that. You remember in the human story, it begins almost in division. Cain and Abel at church, they bring their sacrifices, and right after the benediction, Cain kills Abel. And now the blood soaks into the earth and the earth cries out. And no animal blood can answer that cry. It'll take someone greater than an animal to answer the cry from that ground. And that's where reconciliation takes place. My old preacher used to say it this way, that Jesus was on the cross and he took one hand horizontally and took you and another hand vertically and pulled God and man together at the center of the cross. I like that. God bringing us together in Jesus Christ. In church history, there's a scene that helps explain the alienation, the separation, and the division that was caused by sin there's that great scene where Zwingli and Luther, they have been hammering out all of their discussions through these Reformation propositions. They agreed on everything, the German and the Swiss. They had come to one area, communion. They just couldn't settle it. And there's a scene. For the last hundred years, Luther's hand 
a zwingless hand has been outstretched and is just hanging there, suspended. Luther never returned a gesture and shake that hand. What in the world could we do to keep us separated that long? I can tell you. Now my illustration may not be the best one for a seminary, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. <laughs> it happens when you allow opinion to become doctrine and doctrine to become dogma. I'm a pastor and I heard some of my members discussing this unsacred act called happy hour. It's where you go to the bar and sit down. <laughs> you're miserable all day and you're trying to get happy at the bar. I told you you probably wouldn't like my illustration at the seminary. <laughs> and this actually became a question. And I saw people separate in our church over this one thing, I couldn't believe it. In our highly educated, sophisticated, cultured congregation, that they would fall out about this issue. Can a Christian drink a martini? That was the question. Can we drink a martini? And they took an opinion and turned it into a doctrine. And then they turned a doctrine, their doctrine, into a dogma. You know what dogma is, is what we all hold to. Now that's one thing we smirk at it when you talk about something like a martini. But it's not as laughable when you put it into the human condition and you consider the things that have separated us like ethnicity and culture and class. And I'm telling you, it's ugly then. I knew it would never happen at a place like this, but when I was in seminary, I remember when one of my brothers in seminary who didn't quite look like me, but still my brother, built his argument why certain people should not be invited to certain churches. And I'll never forget the horrendous, ugly, nasty illustration he used. He said that we should put screens up to keep some of the flies from coming to the table. He was talking about keeping black folk out of white churches. Well, I'll leave it there. Be careful not to let alienation and separation keep us apart, turning opinion into doctrine and into dogma. Well, let me lighten it up a little bit because I can see you're getting sad right now. <laughs> It's one of the great things about preaching. You can work with people in the, with the sermon. But move beyond the name and look at the very B section of verse 18. Consider something else. This is what I really want to speak about now, about the ministry of the ambassador without an embassy. Look at verse 18B. All of this begins with God. You see that? But then it ends that verse by saying, who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. But I want to look at this kind of synthetic way. Draw a line from 18b down to 28. And it says, we therefore are ambassadors of Christ. Paul not only could write about this, Paul actually lived this. He knew what it meant to be a minister of of reconciliation, a person that would bring fragmented life together. He knew he could not do it out of just good intentions. I'm not speaking of that. I'm saying Paul knew what it meant once you give the vertical, things could happen on the level of the horizontal. I believe that. If you would ask me, where does it start, Ralph? I would say it begins at the vertical and then it's lived out on the horizontal. I know, I know, we want to start at the horizontal and get to the vertical, but usually it doesn't work that way. He gave us a ministry, Paul said, of reconciliation, and therefore we are ambassadors. I like this. Paul speaks of being an ambassador. <clears throat> In the Roman Empire, there were two kinds of provinces. 
That was the senatorial province and the imperial province. The senatorial province was made up of people that were at peace with Rome. <clears throat> they had no problems with Rome. They lived in the peaceful ways. But that imperial group, that was a radical group, rejecting Rome, not submitting to its leadership or its authority, not, not that group. And so they would have to send ambassadors in to go work with these people, to get things right. And so the ambassadors were sent to imperial provinces to make sure that no rebellion would break out. Sending in an ambassador. You know who the ambassador is. It's the one who is sent and represents the nation of the one who sends them. And I thought about that because when you consider that we are ambassadors, there are some parallels of ambassadors then and ambassadors for Christ now. Can I point one or two of them out? Like then, and you see the difference between ambassadors of Caesar and Rome and Christ ambassadors. Those ambassadors of Caesar, they came in pomp and circumstance, didn't they? But Christ's ambassadors come in the humility and the resurrected power of the living Galilean. The Caesars would send their ambassadors and they would come with all of their raw regal regalia, but not Christ ambassadors. Many times Paul said, I've come to you in chains. And then they would be, when they would be sent, what are the parallels? One is all ambassadors are just that. All ambassadors, they are sent. Now, they are sent. They don't go on their own. They are sent. If you keep living in ministry, those words will mean so much to you that you have been sent. It is in your sending many times that will keep you committed to the one who sent you. I wish I did not know what I was talking about. But you keep living in ministry. You will come through a testing moment where you will be challenged whether to give up and give out and surrender or let the pressures of ministry turn you away. And the only thing that will keep you at that time is your sending. We've seen what happened to people who go on their own. Dennis Rotman went over to North Korea. It's a perfect example of a person who goes as an ambassador with good will and good intention he had. But because he did not know the policy and didn't understand the political travesties, he went thinking that he had gone on good mission and good intent when no good could come out of it. Be careful. Don't send yourself. Let Christ be the one who sends you. Can I give you another thing to pay attention to in this ambassadorship of Christ and the ministry to which God has given to us. Keep in mind that human ambassadors are on term limits. They last as long as the people in power last. Your sending as an ambassador with a ministry of reconciliation is a lifetime ministry. They don't talk about it much anymore. I don't know if it's good theology, I don't know. But I remember my mother, who is a blessed memory to me now, she closed her eyes, folded her tent, and moved upstairs a couple of years ago. And, and, and when I started out this year, 40 years ago, I said to my mother, God had called me to preach. And this is what my mother said to me. My mother, I shouldn't even say this in this public place, but I'm going to do it. It's one of the great things of getting older, you just... Say whatever you want to say now. It's not preaching for reputation or invitation. And she said, the first thing, and I really mean this, she said, I don't know what she meant by this. She said, don't get your P's crossed up. Now, I'll let your imagination run with that. That was one thing she said. But then she said something more serious. And it sort of frightened me. I don't know. Ministry doesn't seem to have that kind of gravitas to it anymore. She said, are you sure God is calling you 
to preach, and I said to her, I believe so, Mama, I think so, and she used this verse. I don't know if this is how New Testament people would interpret this. She says, if you put your hand, and she called it to the gospel plow, and then she said, and look back, she said, and you quit, you're going to hell. Well, that's why I can't stop. I don't, I don't know that's... I don't know if that's quite what Jesus meant when he said that. <laughs> but isn't it amazing that that group of people had that kind of seriousness connected to ministry? I'm almost finished with that. But the last thing about that parallel of ministry is that when you go as an ambassador, ambassador Remember, you speak God's message, not your message. I like reading sometimes military history, and who can read history of military and not at least enjoy that fastidiously dressed, poised under all kind of fire, General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur was such a general that he had been given the distinct honor, not just as an ambassador to Japan, but a super ambassador, where he could go and rebuild. And while he was there, he started changing the message. He had to be pulled from the field because he started changing the message. You and I are ambassadors who have been given a message. We repeat that message, we proclaim that message. Much like the herald who has been given a message from the king, we open up the scroll and we don't preach over the message. We don't preach under or around the message. We preach through the scripture, retelling the very message that God has given to us. Don't forget that. I know in many places preaching has gone and taken a low place on the agenda. I know that. I know it. I preach every week. And I know how people don't want to hear it, but it's what God has given to us as ambassadors to proclaim his message to a world that may not want to hear it. You have to preach it like Salva Lenora did in Italy. Or the way that John Knox would have to stand in Scotland, a Wesley to an England, or a Jonathan Edwards to a colonial America, or Martin Luther King Jr. to a black and white America. You have to preach it whether people want to hear it or not, and not your message, but God's message. Well, there are a lot of people of power who've come and gone, and the reality is you ought to ask yourself sometimes, with all of these potentates and princes and prince and kings and presidents who've sent out ambassadors. You ought to ask yourself sometimes, where are their representatives now? Where, where have those ambassadors gone? If I ask you to give me the name, unless you're a historian, you probably can't name one ambassador that Caesar sent or one ambassador that Tiberius sent. But the very fact that you are at Trinity today suggests that God still have ambassadors with a ministry of reconciliation. It's for no other reason that you are here now, that his ambassadorship, his ministry of reconciliation is still marching on. Now, I could say all of that and still hadn't said nothing if I don't get to this. That's the ministry of the ambassador, but that, you know what the message is, don't you? It's a beautiful message. And that is, reconciliation can only take place, verse 19 and verse 21. The only way it can take place is through Jesus Christ. God did something. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's a message of peace. It's a message of freedom. It's negative on one hand. He does not impute, but it's positive on the other hand. He imputes righteousness. You and I cannot redeem ourselves. Not imputing. 
here God takes on that which we cannot take on ourselves. And more than that, pays a price for that which we cannot pay. Paul knew something about that. You remember when he used those words? He's a prisoner. He's an old man now. He writes and he's sending word to Philemon about Onesimus. He says, I know he may have wronged you, but I met him and he's got himself right now. He's beneficial to you and to me. I'm sending him home. If you love me, take him back in. And then Paul says something. He says, and if he owes you anything, charge it to my account. That's one thing to hear it in the distance. It's something else when you got to pay it. My wife gave her children credit cards when they went to school that I had to pay. <laughs> these, car, these credit cards were for emergencies only, emergencies. And, and Raphael was in Kentucky at school and, and, and the bills were coming in and his bills were high, high. And, and he, he would send them to his mother who in turn would give them to me. And I had no word about this. I was concerned. I said, I thought these cards were designed in all of that, you know, if an emergency came up, and he had plenty of emergencies, uh, you know, Nikes and Popeyes and just all kinds of emergencies. And there they were, and those bills never came to L. They came to me, and you know what I did? I paid them. I didn't make that bill. That's what I tried to say to Miss West. I said, these are not my bills. This is a card that you gave to, gave to him. And she says, pay the bill. <laughs> and I don't have to tell you, I paid the bill. In a higher, heavier, and holier sense, you think about that. You and I had stepped out of bound. We had moved out of the lane of righteousness. We transgressed it, and we could not pay the fine. And yet God, gave that payment to Jesus who took it upon himself and the young man sung it today and the young lady, Jonathan, sung it. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Let me tell you something. You remember those inklings, J.R.R. Tolkien and Lewis and Charles William. They used to meet up all the time at the little bird and the child in Oxford. Well, you know, the less known of the three is Charles Williams. And Charles believed in this doctrine called coherence, where he felt like he could take the suffering of someone else into himself. And he felt that. And that's a nice thing. That's a great gesture, isn't it? That if you had a cold, he felt like he could take that cold into himself. Coherence. He, he, he thought that. But, but as nice as that is, you really can't do it. And yet, Jesus did something greater than that. Took our sins in himself. He who knew no sin to become that, that you and I might become the righteousness of God. I got to sit down. But if I keep going, my soul is going to get happy here. <laughs> because just talking about Jesus does something to me. Let me give you this and I will sit down. Victory is from that cross. One of the great contradictions in American history, Andrew Jackson in the Battle of 1812, he's still fighting down in New Orleans. Washington has already caused a ceasefire, but he kept on fighting. He didn't even know that the battle was over. There are people that we have to remind with the ministry and the message of reconciliation that Christ has already won a battle that the vertical of the cross has brought in the horizontal message to say to them, the war is over if you surrender to the one who has resurrected from the grave. Peace has been declared. Sin has been vanquished. God is propitiated. Sin expiated. The walls have come tumbling down. And now we can come to him just as we are, justice fulfilled, heaven open, hell disappointed, angels singing, saints are going, 
And all of us can say, I now am a minister with a message and a ministry of reconciliation. We can declare that name. God is reconciler. Father, we thank you for the ministry, message, significance of reconciliation. Thank you for the verticalness that help us reach the horizontal. People looking for hope now. Look to these men and women here who prepare themselves to serve you in missions and education and pastoring and youth and children with men and women. Help us to remember we have been reconciled, that we may go and reconcile. In the name of him who reconciled us unto himself, even Jesus Christ and God's people who love him say, amen. <laughs>